Thank you for attending today's researcher talk. Uh, I'm Richard McCulley, the historian at the Center for Legislative Archives, which sponsors this series that gives us the opportunity to uh, learn about uh, the research in progress, as, uh, as well as recently conducted research in the re records of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Please circle your calendar for two more presentations this summer. On June 11th, Peter Shulman of Case Western Reserve University and recipient of the 2011-2012 National Archives Legislative Archives Fellowship uh, will speak to us and discuss his much anticipated book, Coal and Empire, which will be published next month by Johns Hopkins University Press. Peter conducted considerable research in 19th century petitions sent to Congress. Then on July the 9th, we will hear from Scott Podolsky, professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School, who will discuss his book, The Antibiotic, Antibiotic Era, published earlier this year, also by Johns Hopkins University Press. And Scott has thoroughly researched the relevant records of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Subcommittee on Anti-Monopoly and uh, Antitrust and Monopoly. Today, we are delighted to have our very distinguished guest, Glenn Frankel, who is the author of three books, Beyond the Promised Land, Jews and Arabs on the Hard Road to a New Israel, which received the National Jewish uh, Book Award, uh, Rivania's Children, Three Families, and the Cost of Conscience in White South Africa, and The Searchers, The Making of an American Legend. Glenn joined the Washington Post in 1979 and remained there for 27 years, part of that time as editor of the Washington Post Sunday Magazine. From 1986 to 1989, he was the bureau chief in Jerusalem, and in 1989 won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. After four years as a visiting professor of journalism at Stanford University, in 2010, he became the uh, director of the School of Journalism at the University of Texas at Austin and the G.B. Dealey Regents Professor of Journalism. Today, Glenn will discuss his current book project tentatively titled The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of High Noon, and his research in House, the House Un-American Activities Committee records and in other archival collections. He's titled his talk today, Building a Paper Trail, Using Archival Materials to Construct a Narrative. We should have time for questions afterwards. Uh, just please remember to raise your hand uh, so that we can pass the microphone and you can be picked up in the video broadcast. Thank you for joining us, Glenn. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this is a work in progress, so this is going to be extremely ragged. Um, but I want to thank Richard and Bill and Kate and the folks here at the National Archives, a number of other folks who have helped me at this end of things, um, and Carol Swain up at College Park, who's in the uh, motion picture, sound, and video branch up there. The archives has been a very important part of this for me, and I'll explain a little bit about that as I move along. I assume most of you are familiar with High Noon, with the movie, right? The Marshall, uh, you know, in a small town played by Gary Cooper, has to face four very bad guys without any support from the community who are either too frightened or too craven or cowardly um, or too self-interested. The movie was shot like in 28 days um, on a shoestring um, and no one expected it to be much. But immediately after it came out, it became a, a big hit and almost immediately, um, you know, a sort of classic and recognized as a classic film. And, um, and partly the powerful performances and the sort of taut screenplay and the great direction and the wonderful evocative theme song. Actually, the, the title that Richard read out, you know, High Noon and the Making of High Noon and the Hollywood Blacklist, that's actually the subtitle of the book. The, the real title will probably be Do Not Forsake Me, which is the name of the theme song and which speaks very much not only to the film itself but also to the Hollywood Blacklist. I think everybody who's seen High Noon over the years or each generation has sort of come to some conclusions about the political meaning of it or, you know, um, Bill Clinton 
showed it at the White House at least eight times over the years. George W. Bush mentioned it. Dwight Eisenhower loved it when it came out. There's something about, you know, recognizing yourself as one man against, you know, many obstacles and feeling that your friends and allies are letting you down. It seems to appeal to presidents. <laughs> You know, that works for them, especially for Clinton, it, it seemed to work. And, um, and that's the meaning we read into it now. But what most people don't know is that actually the, the man most responsible for creating the movie, Carl Foreman, the scriptwriter and who was the associate producer through most of the film shoot, actually did have a political meeting because Carl was being called, was under threat of subpoena and then was subpoenaed by the House on American Activities Committee in 1951. And he wrote High Noon as the blacklist was just beginning to get rolling. People were beginning, were testifying in that 1951 set of hearings. And um, so he saw himself as the marshal. And he saw uh, the red baiters and the folks of the committee as the four bad guys who had come to town. And he saw the collapse of Hollywood as he interpreted it, as his friends either froze him out or betrayed him. And so... High Noon becomes his allegory of the blacklist. Doesn't necessarily play like that now. You can see High Noon as, as the film of people who are blacklisted in there and compare it to On the Waterfront, which was done by Ilya Kazan and Bud Schulberg, who did name names before the House on American Activities Committee. And you can see their film as a defense of, of testifying. But when we see them today, they seem very similar, I think, in terms of what they're about and what they stand for. Nonetheless, at the time, this was Carl's response. He didn't tell anybody he was doing this. He knew that if that got out, the film would get killed. But nonetheless, this was what was on his mind. And Carl eventually testified in front of the committee in September of 1951, refused to cooperate, um, lost his job very quickly after that, lost his associate producer's credit for High Noon, kept the screenplay credit because they couldn't really take that away. Eventually felt he had to leave the country, spent 25 years in the UK. Um, and uh, so my book is about these sort of two interacting events, the making of this classic movie, which is controversial in itself for many reasons. People are still arguing about who's responsible for why it's so good, why it is so good, first of all, and who's responsible for that. Um, and then the Hollywood blacklist. Um, and because most of these events happened 60 years ago, 65 years ago, most of the participants and the eyewitnesses have passed on. And so my research never has been heavily focused on archival materials, you know, the files, the transcripts of hearings, various contemporary accounts, oral histories, newspaper, magazine articles, all this kind of stuff. And of course, I prefer to use primary sources as much as possible. But but you know, because I maybe because I'm a journalist by trade, I'm willing to use everything I can get my hands on. I've spent a lot of time interviewing people. I'm not a historian, as far as I'm concerned, but I've interviewed uh, you know several major historians of the blacklist. Um, you know, I've interviewed family members, the ones who are still surviving, of some of the folks I'm interested in. Um, some of these materials obviously require more skepticism than others, but they're all, you know, I'm kind of an equal opportunity researcher. All this stuff for me is worth coming at. It's sort of like, you know, when you're building a house, you've got a foundation of things um, and scaffolding, but you also need, you know, paint and decorative bits, and you need to know what people sounded like, what they looked like, what seemed funny to them, who they lusted after, what their relationships were with other people, all that is stuff that's important to me. And because I write sort of, I guess you could say, popular history and narrative, that means I'm trying to tell stories. And the tools we use for that are things like dialogue, characters, scenes. Um, in fact, all of these stories, all my books and everything I write is sort of character driven. Um, I'm trying to capture the moral dilemmas that people faced um, at the heart of my story what their values were, what their backgrounds were, how they reacted to this, how it changed them, um, what they felt they had to do. And I'm interested in the whole sort of spectrum of human response to a, to a moral and political and economic crisis. And the blacklist is a wonderful, rich, turbulent, difficult subject. 
the emotions run so high in the story. And like a lot of these kinds of situations, you know, you have your, your enemies, your political enemies, you know, right versus left and things like that. But even more emotional and more powerful in some ways and more scary are the conflicts between people within one community, within the left, for example, who are still arguing about the blacklist. People within families are still, you know, disputing what happened and who sold out whom and who was a sellout and who wasn't. Um, and so I've gotten to go to many, you know, research is both a very dry, careful, slow process, but I've gotten to go to wonderful places for this book. Um, in New York, you know, where Victor Navasky's, uh, where Victor Navasky himself in the files for his wonderful book, Naming Names, which is one of the great Hollywood blacklist books from the early 80s. Um, his files are at NYU um, Library. I've been able to see all that. I've been to uh, the New York Public Library, the Performing uh, Arts Library up at Lincoln Center has some great material. Been to LA, I just spent a month. Um, a lot of it at the Motion Picture Academy Library, the Margaret Herrick Library, but also at USC and UCLA. Um, been to London because Carl Foreman ended up living there for 25 years and became uh, a member of the Board of Governors of the British Film Institute. And when he died, his widow donated large parts of his papers, not all of them, but some of them, to the British Film Institute. Uh, been to Carthage, Texas, because that's where the Tex Ritter Country Music Museum is. And Tex Ritter sang, do not forsake me, and the story of how that was done and how he got involved in it and who wrote it and all that. It's, you can find some of that there. Salinas, California, where um, um, Bruce Church, who was the lettuce magnet, a uh, great wealthy lettuce grower, uh, lived. And he's the guy who financed a lot of high noon. And, um, and Helena, Montana, which is the birthplace of Gary Cooper. And finally, finally, here, you know, both the Library of Congress, of course, but, but here at the National Archives, because this is where I've done the key research on the House on American Activities Committee. And that's what I'll try to focus on for a few minutes today. I mean, we're not a big room here, so we could, like, just talk about this. And that's what I'd like to do. But, let me run by, you know, just, just set up things a little more. Um, HUAC, as you may know, I mean, first, post-war HUAC, the, Richard, the committee that Richard Nixon and a few other folks sat on for a while, they descended on Hollywood in 1947. Um, and they were hunting for communists and fellow travelers. They were trying to see communist infiltration of the motion picture industry. And this turned out to be a wonderful public relations bonanza for them. Uh, and it resulted in the conviction and eventual imprisonment of the folks who were known as the Hollywood Ten. Uh, these were mostly screenwriters, but also a director or two and producers um, who'd been identified as being in the party or formerly having been in the party. Um, all of them re basically refused to answer questions. And they invoked the First Amendment in doing so. I said, well, we'll answer it our way. But, but really, they were there. It was a very belligerent, difficult session. It wasn't clear what was going to happen. The committee didn't have that much popular support at that point. Um, but in the end, the courts upheld contempt of Congress uh, convictions of all 10 of them. And they all ended up in, in, in jail for about a year later on. At first, many of the Hollywood studios were inclined to resist the committee. Um, they want to run their business the way they want to run their business. If they wanted to hire people to write for them, you know, they wanted to be able to do that. But after the courts upheld the convictions and with a number of other things going on, like the beginning of the Korean War, the Hiss case, various things, the things really turned. And by um, the Hollywood establishment joined in condemning not only these 10, but in establishing a loyalty oath uh, and in issuing a public statement that they were not going to hire or continue to employ people who were members of subversive organizations. Um, and the studio heads were under enormous pressure from what I would say is a fairly unholy alliance of the FBI and HUAC and citizen groups like the American Legion and, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars and also the Great Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, which was a Hollywood-based group that at this point in 1951 was chaired by John Wayne. 
And they sort of in combination, and we could talk about, you know, what was the blacklist, but uh, these, these groups all contributed to what ended up being a blacklist and a process. Um, and the blacklist lasted for a decade or more. Um, so after the great success of 47, the committee came back to Hollywood in 51 for all the reasons that are obvious. It's a great place to get publicity. And this time Hollywood reacted with not just slow building panic, but a, a real sense of, of fright, of anxiety. A reporter for Life magazine said it was like a group of marooned sailors on a flat desert island watching the approach of a tidal wave. If you were called to testify in 51 and you wanted to keep your job, you had to basically go through a process of, of humiliation, um, confession, and then penance. You had to do all that. You, you agreed to cooperate. There was like four stages, I guess, you might say. You denounced the, par the Communist Party and your own misplaced idealism and naivete that had gotten you involved with the party or with others who were in the party. Uh, then you praised the committee for the wonderful work it was doing to meet this menace and defeat it. And finally, to prove your good faith, you had to name names of other people. That was the final thing. It's, you know, uh, and then if you did all that, you could continue working in Hollywood. If you didn't do that, you would, be, you would not be able to work. That's what it came down to. And in 1951, this is when this process really takes root. Um, now, there are many, many wonderful memoirs and oral histories and, and books about the Hollywood blacklist and studies of individuals involved in it, you know, people caught up in it, and memoirs of people who were involved. But the two sort of classic authoritative accounts are Victor Navasky's Naming Names and then The Inquisition in Hollywood by Larry Suppler and Stephen England. And these are wonderful books, um, and they hold up very well. They were both published in the early 1980s. That's a long time ago, of course. And even though they're very thoroughly researched, um, lots of other materials have become available since then, including the opening of uh, thousands of HUAC files here. Um, officially in late 2001, I don't know how many years it took for them all to get out. Um, but that means that there's still a lot of sort of untilled soil here. I don't know of anyone who's done an all a sweeping Hollywood blacklist book since you know the 80s. Um, and all that is, I'm sure a lot of you know, most of the, the public hearings of the committee and its annual reports have all been digitized. You can, you know, you can get them if you're somebody like me. You can you can print them all out, you know, from online. And, and put them in a staples box. But when you come here to the National Archives, it's still kind of much a paper world um, for this particular thing. The finding aid for NARA consists of four fat, black, loose leaf notebooks, right? Um, which uh, Bill and Kate and other folks upstairs are very happy to you know, show you, let you use. You can find some of those materials and in some of those indexes online, some of the finding aids, but most of it is in is you go through there and you turn the pages and you look through and then these folks here help you find the materials and give you lots of good advice as to what you're really looking for and where it might be. Um, I don't know when these notebooks first got put together, late 70s, early 80s, late 80s, I'm really not sure. Um, they've been around for a while, they look, yeah, they, they look like they've been around a while. Um, you know. They, it's, what you find there, there are like 94 boxes of executive session transcripts. There are 89 boxes of Hollywood blacklist investigative materials. Uh, 682 feet of file and reference uh, individual, you know, with names of, of individual people and organizations. This isn't just the Hollywood blacklist, it's HUAC. Um, but there are things specifically designated as Hollywood blacklist and you, can have a look at them. Uh, all in all, uh, the, the HUAC has like something like 2,100 feet of files here. And frustratingly, though, they're incomplete. Um, it seems like periodically the HUAC investigators went through their own files and purged them over time. And in the late 60s, I think they destroyed a lot of stuff. Um, not, again, not just Hollywood, but a lot of things. Um, so what you find in the investigators' files are 
a few letters and this and that, but you don't see the investigations. You, it's very hard to see. Uh, the cooperation between HUAC and the FBI, which had done its own endless investigations in Hollywood and which had acquired uh, the entire membership of the Communist Party in Los Angeles, for example, all the names and the card numbers and all that, all of which was then made available to HUAC and which became really the basis of HUAC being able to decide who they could really, you know, stick it to. Um, none of that transaction is in the files that I can see. All of that happened and, and doesn't exist anymore. Um, William Wheeler, the great Hollywood HUAC investigator, uh, um, you know, his, his files are very, have been purged a great deal. There's some files from Bill Wheeler, nothing from 1951 when he first goes out there. Uh, not the, the, his files, I think, begin in 53 or 54, and again, they're very limited. So, you know, in spite of all the paper, there are things that are missing. Nonetheless, there's several sort of interesting mysteries or research things that the files can clear up. Uh, Bill Wheeler was a tall, handsome, sort of all-American, boy-looking kind of guy, a uh, very kindly face, soft-spoken. People talk about how nice he was, even as he was serving them the sort of pink salmon uh, subpoenas. And, uh, you know, and the people he served them to, you know, they faced a terrible choice. They, you, you could either, like, hang tough and refuse to cooperate, uh, and if you cited the First Amendment, your right of free speech and free assembly, you could go to jail. Or you could, um, you could invoke the Fifth Amendment, which suggested you had something incriminating that you had to defend yourself from. Um, and that might uh, allow you to avoid the contempt of Congress citation. But in either case, you'd lose your job. I mean, you'd be blacklisted almost immediately. And, um, or if you'd already been blacklisted, you wouldn't be able to get out from under it. Or you could cooperate. Uh, you could name names, keep your job, stay out of jail, and all you would lose really is your self-respect. So, and, and your friends. Um, so, you know, well, yeah, but you'd be blacklisted. I, that's why you would leave the country, sure, sure. Now, Carl Foreman, remember, he's the high noon script writer. Um, and he's my main, really main character for this part of the book. Um, he'd been in the Communist Party before the war, and then he uh, he drifted in and out, and, and drifted away from the party for good around 1948. But he still refused to cooperate with the committee when he was called in, in September 51. He wouldn't say if he'd ever been a party member, even though he merely said he wasn't one now. Um, unlike the Hollywood 10, he was very polite and soft-spoken. They stopped the hearing three times in the transcript to ask him to speak louder. Um, he's drinking water. I've seen, you know, photographs and a little bit of footage. Um, but his refusal to cooperate meant he was, you know, doomed immediately. And two days later, his boss, Stanley Kramer, the head of the Stanley Kramer Production Company, which made High Noon, um, announced that Carl would be dealt with as soon as the board of the company could get together. And a month later, because Carl was a member of the board and was an officer of the company, they, they had a financial settlement with him, but he was fired a month later. And, and Carl's now available HUAC dossier, which um, says, you know, shows he was a member of party, shows his membership book, book number, uh, Shows that he'd gone on special leave when he joined the army in May 1943 because the Communist Party decided they didn't want their members to be, they, they wanted their members to serve, but they didn't want them to be members of the party at that point. So his, his membership lapsed. Six witnesses named him to HUAC as a member of the party in public or executive sessions. They also had that he'd been a writing instructor at the People's Educational Center, which the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney General, listed as a subversive organization, where he'd, he'd taught screenwriting there. Uh, and then he, and then the other condemning thing was he'd signed the Amicus Curiae brief for two of the Hollywood Ten in their when they brought their case to the Supreme Court. Just supporting these folks in their Supreme Court case was a sign that you were a subversive. So. Uh, 
I also had a witness, an informant, and several informants actually, who claimed that Carl was the last sort of lefty on the Screenwriters Guild board, um, which is probably the case. He was the last lefty at that point. They'd purged all the rest. Um, and the claim was he was the Communist Party agent on the board, which is a little more difficult. And within a few months, Carl was on an ocean liner heading to London because he couldn't work. Um, but his story has a mysterious postscript, and that and the answer to that mystery, or one answer, is in the HUAC files here. Um, in London, Carl wrote several scripts under pseudonyms and was very successful for a while. He was a co-writer of the script for The Bridge on the River Quiet that won the Academy Award. He and a guy named Michael Wilson, who was a real commie, and, uh, you know, and, and stayed true to the party throughout his life. Um, but they, they didn't get to write it under our names. It was written under the name of Pierre Boulle, who was, who was the novelist, the French novelist who'd written The Bridge on the River Kwai, who didn't speak any English. Event. After that, everybody, you know, people knew in Hollywood what had happened. And Columbia Pictures wanted to re-sign Carl. Um, but first, he had to get himself cleared. And, you know, he'd been in London five years. It was difficult, really difficult to be away. It was incredible. You can imagine when High Noon became a success and Carl's sitting there in London and even though he's got the screenwriter's credit, nobody's acknowledging him and he can't go to the Academy Award ceremony and he can't, you know, it's just, you know, it ate him up. Uh, anyway, his lawyer suggested that maybe they could work something out with the committee. Uh, and they arranged for Carl to testify in a closed executive session in August of 1956. Now, for years, this session has been like the source of endless speculation and gossip, especially among people on the left, as to what Carl actually said in that session. Did he name names? You know, um, some people, one person I talked to last month, Norma Barsman, who's from that era, believes that Carl stooled. And that's why in order to get clearance. Carl always denied it. But it's been a mystery. Carl didn't release the executive transcript. I think he had a copy. Uh, the committee didn't release it. So what, the, what did he do and how did he get out from under this thing? Um, others were, didn't believe he'd name names, but they were still upset with him because he must have denounced the Communist Party. And, uh, and Carl did admit he had done that, but he, he you know, he had had genuine reservations and criticisms of the party, and he was willing to go the extra step with the committee. Um, he and his lawyer argued that by doing this and getting back cleared, he was breaking the blacklist, and, and that would pave the way for others. Anyway, in March 1957, Columbia Pictures announced they had a four-picture deal with Carl. Um, and they said Carl had cooperated with the committee and was thus cleared of any taint of communism. And this caused a huge backlash at the American Legion, its Americanism Committee, and a few other places. The enforcers of the blacklist who said, wait a minute, what are we talking about here? And then they put the screws to the chairman of the committee, Francis Walter, um, to the point where in June, Francis Walter issues a statement, which you can find here. It says, in 1956, Carl Foreman presented himself for interrogation. Um, we could actually just put it up on the board. No, I guess we... I guess we can't. We'll put some other things up there, like maybe that. Richard will be the first thing to put up. He presented himself for interrogation under an oath, under oath for a staff inquiry. It wasn't a formal hearing, nor was it ever released. Walter insisted in the statement that at no time the committee had characterized Carl as a cooperative witness, and the committee doesn't grant clearances anyway. The committee's not in charge of the blacklist, you know. Uh, the American Legion pounced on this and others, and they called on Columbia to cancel the contract. Just to make things a little spicier, a, a columnist with The Hollywood Reporter, which was this daily Hollywood uh, gossip sheet daily that was very much in the forefront of pushing the blacklist, uh, wrote that the committee was going to hold an executive session to probe the report that one of its members had received money, quote, to clear a show business personality of suspicions of being a red. They were basically saying that Chairman Walter had been bribed. Um, what's missing from all this, of course, is the actual transcript of the executive session. Um, 
But, and since 2002, that's been sitting you know, in an open uh, file. That's, that's the first page of it. Um, I can't find anyone who's actually read this. You know. um, and the transcript says up there quite clearly that this is a committee meeting. The committee convened is the first sentence at 3 p.m. You know, in the House office building, Francis E. Walter presiding. But the only people present are Francis E. Walter, the chair of the committee, and the lawyer, Richard Ahrens. Uh, now, Richard Ahrens was a very hardliner, really mean-spirited, uh, true believer. Um, and later, he said that he had no idea, almost when he went into the room, what the meeting was about. And he had nothing on Carl Foreman. Um, Ahrens hadn't been the lawyer for the committee back in 51. So there they were. Uh, Carl repeats his insistence in this transcript that he's not going to name names. This is a personal matter of personal conviction for me. Uh, and he says, look, if I'd come across activities in the Communist Party that were subversive, conspiratorial, illegal, or treasonous, I would have gone to the FBI. But there wasn't anything like that. You know, there were a lot of naive idealists, uh, basically, including me, he, he would say. Nobody joins the Communist Party to make things work. They join with the feeling they're going to help make a better world. And he goes on and on. And, and he refuses to, to, to give them most of what they want. Um, who induced you? Ahrens asks him, do you recall the circumstances when you first came in contact with the committee? Who induced you to join? What cell were you part of? In each question, his answer is no, I don't remember. I can't tell you. I just went to meetings. I never saw a script slanted for communist purposes. I never got work because I was in the party. Uh, on page 16, Ahrens asks him, if the chairman gives you his solemn promise that this record will be protected as an executive record and not be made public, will you, you know, name names? No. It's one word answer. And Walter then intervenes. He says, I don't think that is important. The thing that is important now is the opportunity Mr. Foreman has sought to try and let the world know what a phony communism is. And then Carl takes the bait and denounces communism for three or four pages. It's an institution that's trapped a lot of people into betraying themselves and accepting evils which are absolutely unspeakable. A cynical group in New York, controlled thing, you know, that sort of thing. He goes after the party for a while. But that's it. I have no sympathy, admiration, or regard, or anything like that for the Communist Party in any way. I think it's reprehensible. And at the end of the session, Chairman Walter and Ahrens thank, thank him. Arendt, Walter says, I'm sure you've made a contribution toward the objectives we've all been striving for. Case closed. Now, you know, transcripts can be uh, incomplete. Um, there are four places in this transcript where Carl went off the record. And we don't know what that was about. But if he did name names, there's no reason why the committee wouldn't have made that public. The whole point in naming names was to name them publicly. It's not like they didn't know the names. They had all the names. You were supposed to name them because that's what proved that you were. And, and so this wonderful transcript, as I say, is sitting in the files here and I think resolves some of this. You know, I can't say for sure, but I'm fairly confident that Carl didn't name any names. So why did Francis Walter let Carl off the hook? Bribe? It certainly was possible. Columbia Pictures was run by Harry Cohen, kind of guy who, you know, thought money could basically solve anything. He was very tight with his money. But, you know, the other thing is uh, Francis Walter was a conservative Democrat from Eastern Pennsylvania. He actually never did like the naming of names. Um, I don't know how many of you heard of Larry Parks. Larry Parks was an actor, an up-and-coming, talented guy, a Communist Party member. He'd been nominated for an Academy Award for the Al Jolson story. He was the first witness in March 1951, and he ran into a buzzsaw. He wanted to denounce the party. He did denounce the party in the hearing, but he didn't want to name names. He didn't want to go through that humiliation. And the committee hounded him and hounded him that day to name names. And eventually they called him into an executive session. And, they, and even though he pleaded with them, um, they basically said, you've got to do this. And Walter intervenes in that executive session. He says, how can it be material to the purpose of this inquiry to have the names of people when we already know them? 
And he goes on, isn't it more important to learn about the subversive activities than to get a long list of names of bleeding hearts and fools and suckers <laughs> and hard-boiled communist politicians? But the committee's staff attorneys, Frank Tavener, replies, we're entitled to receive proof of the information, which is in the file. In other words, you can't investigate the communist influence unless you know who they were, which makes sense. And Walter feels really bad for Larry. And there's in this executive transcript from this one, at the end of Parks' testimony, where he, and he's named six or eight people, and he's miserable, Wal, uh, you know, Walter says to him, I think you could get some comfort out of the fact that the people whose names have been mentioned here have been subpoenaed, so that if they ever do appear here, it won't be the result of anything you have testified to. And Larry Parks gives this uh, five-word answer. It is no comfort whatsoever. So that's Chairman Walter. It's very hard to know what was going on with him. He did tell Carl's lawyer one extra thing when, when they were negotiating this session. He said his daughter was going to Sarah Lawrence in New York. And he was fed up with the fact that the, the daughters of a couple of blacklisted people were at Sarah Lawrence, and they were treated as heroes. And his daughter was shunned. And uh, you know, don't these kids know anything about communism and what it is? And the lawyer, Sid Cohen, said, well, if you call Carl, you know, get Carl up there. He's not going to name any names for you, but he will tell, you, tell people how bad communism is. Happy to do that. And Walter agreed. So maybe this clears up a mystery. Maybe it doesn't. But Carl did get back to Hollywood after this and was allowed to work and had a very successful career. I want to, you know, I'm going to stop in just a minute, but I want to mention one other guy. Um, and let's put this one up. Because, um, you know, when I'm looking at people, I'm looking at, all right, so that's one sort of hard, tough response to the committee. But there were other screenwriters who had other responses. A man named Martin Berkeley was a screenwriter like Carl. He was named as a former communist in April 1951 by another screenwriter, Richard Collins. And Martin's first response to this was an angry telegram to the committee saying, you know, I was named today. I've read today's dispatches. I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Communist Party, nor will I become one. And Collins is guilty of perjury. And he insists on testifying immediately. So that's Martin's you know, off-the-cuff response. And over time, he thinks it over. And in the files here, you can see them sort of putting a little pressure on them. For example, there's a, a, a Bill Wheeler. Uh, talks about um, meeting with Richard Collins. And, and, and Richard describes, the screenwriter who named Martin, describes having dinner with Martin after he named him. And Martin asks him, do they really have like the membership cards? And Bill says, <laughs> and, and, and Richard told him, yeah, they do. They do. So Martin changed direction. <laughs> he thought better of it all. Uh, once he knew that, as Frank Tavener says, the committee has some pretty strong evidence against Berkeley, and he knows it. And ultimately, before he was through, he named 160 people. Dashiell Hammett, Lillian Hellman, Dorothy Parker, all those you know, sort of big names, and he named Carl. And that's why I can want to rope Martin into my story. Um, he turns out to be the sort of anti-Carl, right? Uh, now Martin, you know, after all this was over, eventually he left the country. He moved to Spain just because he, you know, his career was sort of in the tank. He developed Parkinson's and he died in 1979. And because of his illness, there are no interviews with him. Victor Navasky writes some letters in Spain and he writes back saying, I'd love to talk to you, but I'm sick and my doctor says I can't do this in any way. I'm not, you know, you know. Um, he's not, there are no interviews that I've found with Martin, no oral histories. And so in most of the blacklist books, he gets about a page. And usually he's a, the walk-on villain. You know, He's kind of a moon-faced guy and uh, easy to make fun of. And he's despised really by both sides because he's such a sycophant. Um, but the HUAC executive sessions that are now available here um, help round out this sort of portrait of a very desperate guy. They don't make him sympathetic, but they do make him more real. Um, He's got his lawyer, Edward Bennett Williams, the great Edward Bennett Williams, uh, who costs a lot of money but really knew how to get you out from under this. Uh, 
you know, they, they take him into executive session and they ask him for more names after he's already done 150 or so. They ask him about a woman named Betty Anderson. And Martin is a great spinner of stories. He says, ah, oh, yes, Betty, uh, her married name now is Betty Wilson. I, I forget, uh, she was the secretary for one of the organizations. I understand she's left the party and I'm extremely happy. Nice person, very nice girl, I'm frank to say so. You know, he's starting to like tell stories for them. Uh, uh, the people he likes. If it's an attractive woman, he'll point that out, you know. And then by the time he testifies in another executive session in January 1952, it's like the Martin Berkeley show. It's 68 pages of him talking about the party and all of his friends and the people he knew. He starts out by telling him about the great evangelical work he's doing now in his new role as sort of a professional anti-communist. He's spoken at four American Legion posts at Kaiwanis and, and Rotary Club meetings. He's soon going to be at the Jewish League Against Communism and the Peace Officers Association of the San Joaquin Valley, you know. And it would do your hearts good to have seen the way they have reacted to my testimony and to know how highly regarded these, uh, these individuals on this present committee are regarded. It's been a wonderful, wonderful thing to have happened to me. But he does have a complaint. He's having trouble getting work. Uh, I can't get a job, and none of the rest of us, the people who would name names, can get jobs. And none of us are going to get jobs unless something's done. I've worked for 10 straight years without a day's layoff, an average of forty dollars to $55,000 a year. I have as fine a commercial credits as any writer in the business, and suddenly there isn't any work. They claim, he claimed, there was a blacklist, and he was on it, and it was done by the, you know, it was a blacklist of communist sympathizers um, for freezing him out. Uh, anyway, he wants work, he wants money. I believe it would be desirable for this committee to make a formulation of some kind and issue some sort of statement on the status of the friendly witnesses, to issue a general statement about our employability. So Martin is twisting these guys around his little finger, and he's working so hard. Um, here is this a nice letter to Bill Wheeler, you know, complaining that Bill hasn't answered his letters for a while, and you know, dear Bill, I know you've been busy, but you might want to give a guy a buzz every now and then. And he then describes how he's having trouble getting a job. And uh, he wants them to try to do something about it. And they tried. He writes, uh, this, is not in, this is in the HUAC file, in the Motion Picture Academy files, and they had a hopper collection. of The, the, the gossip columnist had a hopper. There's a number of letters from Martin. Uh, Thanks for your hospitality and understanding. I'm back on Freedom Road again, and people like yourself made it possible. I mean, Martin is, you know, he's swimming as fast as he can. Um, but it doesn't work so well. And I, you know, I, I just found it fascinating to see what you've got here that speaks to him direct. Um, so I want to just add this. I mean, the files, the transcripts, are really important. They tell you a lot of things about these folks. Um, and in writing narrative, they're especially useful because you get to hear your character under deep stress. You get to see him or her interact with their interrogators. But then you have to add other bits. Um, the letters, the reminiscences of friends and enemies, the interviews you can get. Um, in, in Martin's case, thanks to Alice Kreitz, who's a great researcher and has helped me on this, and he's over there, um, you know, I found Martin's son, Bill, who lives in Asheville, North Carolina. I was kind of hoping Bill would be a really sympathetic voice for Martin, and Bill really isn't quite that sympathetic. He thinks his father was a bit craven, but, uh, you know, but he told me things that were really interesting. He said Mar Martin was basically apolitical. He, he, he never talked about politics at home. And uh, for him to do what he did seemed a fair amount out of character, Bill said. But I remember enough of those days. Rationality went out the window. It was all the emotions. To me, that was an act of somebody who was trying to get people and hurt people. And that really wasn't my dad. He wasn't like that. To me, he was just desperately trying to survive. And so you have to take, I think, the bits you know, you, you take the stuff that's in writing, you add to it everything you can, and again, uh, you try to put yourself inside the heads of some of these folks, um, why they did the things they did, you try to, you know, why they made those choices, and what the consequences were of those things. That's the added value that I think writing in the narrative form brings to historical events. 
in the end, if you're very, very lucky, you can come up with something that gives you a sense of people. Because to me, the question always is, well, what would I do, right, in that circumstance? Would I have named names? Would I have hung in there? You know, the Communist Party, that was a, that was a organization that somewhere up the line reported to the common term. They were outsiders. The anxiety, the level of fear at that time over these folks was just as bad as the level of anxiety and fear now that we have about Al-Qaeda and terrorism. Only communists, they could look like you or me. I mean, they could be anybody. And yet they were in the highest you know, levels of government. There was a real paranoia and anxiety. And to be able to grasp that and to grasp the terrible things that people did as a result of that, it's the personal story that, that, that I'm really concerned about and that the archives are just a very important part of. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm happy to take questions or to hear about what's, if anybody else has been doing HUAC at all. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about the interpretation of high noon and how quickly that interpretation emerged. Is this something that Carl Foreman expressed at the time, saying, while writing high noon, I was had this in mind? Or is this something that emerges over the years as people look back at it? That's a good question. This is from Carl, but he told nobody at the yeah. time. Fred Zinneman was the director of high noon. He was a liberal, but Fred was a Viennese, uh, Viennese uh, exile in Hollywood, and you know, Carl felt Fred didn't need to know this, uh, was a real partner. He didn't want Gary Cooper to know about it. Gary Cooper was a rock-ribbed Republican from Montana. He sure didn't want Stanley Kramer to know because Stanley was very nervous about Carl's being called to testify in this. I haven't even gone into the story of what happened between Stanley and Carl, which is at the heart of the book. Um, so he told nobody. And, you know, I think Carl may have exaggerated a little bit as time went on and, and it became more meaningful to him to be interpreted that way. But Carl said that specifically there are lines of dialogue from the mayor of the town and a few other people that were lines that he had heard. And then one or two of them for, were from Stanley <laughs> himself. And I do believe that. And I believe that's one of the reasons why when Stanley saw the, uh, the director's cut, he wasn't too happy for a number of reasons. But one of them I think was he could see a little bit of what Carl was doing. And did, when, in the time he spent in the UK, did he continue to work in film there? Yeah, he did, though it was very difficult. He first got there and the rank organization wanted to sign him to a deal. One of the things that's so fascinating, these are, the, the Stanley Kramer Company was like this little nimble startup in Hollywood. You know, they, they, these were guys who were in their 30s. Uh, Stanley was from Hell's Kitchen in New York, and Carl was from Chicago, Fred was from Vienna, you know, young Jewish guys who wanted to make interesting, smart movies, and they made a couple of really good ones, Champion with Kirk Douglas, The Men with Marlon Brando, and High Noon, among others. And, uh, you know, so they, they had gotten this going, oh, so I've lost my track, well, the, the question was... Did he continue to work in... Yeah, so he gets, to, he gets to London, and he's a big deal. He's been nominated three times in a row for Academy Award for Best Screenwriter. And the rank organization signs him up almost immediately, and then pretty immediately right after that, when they tell the folks at United Artists, they've got Carl Foreman on the payroll to help do stuff, United Artists says, oh, just a bit of a problem. Because United Artists is in the States. And in fact, the British Film Institute was largely, uh, British film industry was greatly financed by American film companies, for one thing or another. They wiped him off the books. So he couldn't work for rank. Um, Joe Losey, Joseph Losey, the great director um, of The Servant and many other movies, was also blacklisted and left the country. Joe said about the British studios, they said, uh, they really liked it when we showed up in London. They wanted to use us. They knew we could make good movies. They knew we could do it cheaply. They figured we knew movie stars and would get movie stars into the movies. You know, they knew we could work fast and all that. And they thought they could do all this without anyone ever finding out. <laughs> you know? So it was very hard for them to work above, above the table. They ended up, you know, that's for actors. I mean, that's why very few actors in the end were blacklisted. Most of them who were trapped weaseled their way out of it, named names or did what they had to do, because an actor can't do that. 
A director really can't do that either. But screenwriters can write screenplays under pseudonyms, and Carl wrote several. Michael Wilson not only wrote Bridge in the River Kwai, he wrote Lawrence of Arabia, or he was a big contributor to Lawrence of Arabia. Friendly Persuasion. These are all Academy Award winning uh, screenplays that Michael Wilson was involved in, but you don't see Michael Wilson's name on until 1984. After Michael Wilson was dead seven years by then, Carl was, on the day before Carl died, I think the Motion Picture Academy finally announced that they were going to give uh, Oscars to Michael and Carl, and their widows picked them up. Hi, I'm a uh, red diaper baby, so Hi. actually wow. a pink diaper baby, according to those who think that my mother wasn't really that uh, involved. Not yet. You know the deal. Uh, my field is World War I, but I have friends who dabbled in this. I have one who is absolutely convinced that uh, the reason that a lot of these files were purged was to eliminate the anti-Semitic remarks in them. So what do you think about that? Um, you know, it's certainly possible. I think... The sort of surface, very open anti-Semitism was mostly in the early 1940s. Martin Diaz, uh, when he was, you know, running a committee, Texan uh, representative who just said anything came into his little head. Um, Rankin, who was the chair in, in 47, you know, was famous for things. There were, and you know, it's important to note that what 50, 60 percent of the people who were blacklisted were Jewish. Um, ethnically or in some form, and that Hollywood, most of the Hollywood studios were, you know, were run by Jews. Um, there's a whole undercurrent in the blacklist story that might feel familiar to us today. It's it's sort of a backlash movement of, you know, that it lost the New Deal had triumphed, and then we'd gone to World War II, but there were a lot of people out there who didn't like the New Deal and didn't want to <laughs> want World War II either, and they kind of bided their time, and they felt their country had gotten away from them. And, you know, so the blacklist is, and the Red Scare is part of this sort of backlash movement to get our country back. Our culture's been stolen by these Jews in Hollywood. Our country's been stolen by communists and liberals. You know, if you substitute, you know, Muslims from Kenya for some of those terms, you get a similar feel. You know, now, we, you know, now our country's being stolen by different groups of people. And Jews were very much at the heart of that. So there's a strong current of that. But the 51-52 committee is much more careful about any of that getting out there publicly. So is it in the files? I'm sure there are things in the files. I think, I don't know why the files were destroyed. It's just so easy to do, you know. So anything that might embarrass you, you know, won't be there anymore if, if you destroy them. And I'm sure there were many embarrassing things, and it's certainly plausible that that's one of them. David. We're going to get you on. Yeah. Yeah. The chairman of the 5152 was John Stevens Wood, who's his own fascinating character. How much yeah. does he play a part in your? Yeah, you know, I've had trouble getting real personalities out of the committee members in 51 and 52. Nixon, Dick's gone, you know, our, our favorite congressman has moved on to, to greater heights of glory. These guys are kind of, I, there's nothing about Stevens that seems interesting. The, the, the guys on the staff, Taverner and Ahrens are interesting. They're real hardliners. A guy named Jackson from California says some amazing things. In the, but I, I don't see much... They're, they're going about their business. They become a little more, a little smarter. The 47 hearing eventually worked for them because the Hollywood 10 went to jail. But at the time, it didn't seem to be working very well. And they, they, they shut it down. They were supposed to call 19 witnesses, you know, unfriendly witnesses. They stopped at 10 because it was embarrassing and weird for them. I and think, didn't Drew Pearson claim that the Wood also maybe took a bribe to shut it down or that he was pressured to shut well, it down? Well, there was a lot of pressure to shut it down. I, yeah, there was talk of a bribe, but mostly Pearson, I think he discovered that one that Wood had been involved in, yeah, in a money thing with lawyers. Yeah, there was a lot of embarrassing stuff. And which one? Rankin ended up in jail, right? Which one ended up in a... Thomas. Thomas. And it, Parnell Thomas, thank you. Ended up in the same jail as two of the Hollywood 10, the same prison in Pennsylvania, right, or West Virginia. 
is to the Hollywood Ten, or maybe it was Connecticut, you know, cleaning out chickens, clean the chicken coops. Um, that was for bribery and other things. So, but the 51, 52 guys were more gray, I think were gray men by and large. You get some Veldi and Jackson say some outrageous stuff in the hearings, and they're bullies, you know. They really, once they, they get poor Larry Parks there and they just kick, kick him in the head over and over. This is a very self-serving question, but were you able to find any material on Tavener? On, I'm sorry? Tavener, the uh, I found in the obituaries, um, I found a couple of speeches that Tavener gave that are later in the 50s that are just frothing at the mouth. You get this whole, yeah, I think I have some of that. It's fascinating when you read the way people characterize communists. Um, it's like the way we would characterize zombies. You know, they have no soul. They only want one thing. You can count on them lying about everything. You know, and, and there is this great fear and anxiety about these folks that is just, and Tavener, you know, is a Christian. He's very much, uh, and, and he, I think it's him, you know, I may get Tavener and Ahrens, I may conflate them a bit. There's a real strong Christian sense of, of beating these people back. And that begins to, you know, feel pretty <laughs> uncomfortable after a while. But they really felt they were in a fight for the death and that we were losing. That we were losing. These people were out to destroy our country and we had to defeat them. And, and you know, it's very much, it feels like every Western democracy, I can say from my brief experience in the news business, faced with, faced with a threat that it perceives as existential, reacts immediately by shutting down all the civil liberties, you know, whether it's the global war on terror or the blacklist or other things. You could make the case the blacklist was a relatively benign version. We didn't stand up people and shoot them, you know, um, but we really did a lot of damage. And that was because at least there were cynical people involved in it, like, you know, Congressman Nixon and others who used it simply to aid their political careers. But there was, but there was also a belief, you know, it was based on something real and frightening and that people took to, to the extremes. Would you talk just a little more about who actually created the blacklist uh, and who enforced the blacklist and for how long was it enforced? That's all good questions. Um, so in 47, after the hearings ended in a sort of debacle for both sides, um, the, um, the, the studio heads or their representatives got together at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York in November of 47. And they announced, and after basically resisting the committee, Eric Johnston, the head of this, who had testified in a very sort of civil liberties oriented way at the committee, told the studio heads, we gotta do something about this and we gotta do it now. And they issued a, they rammed through a declaration that said we're not gonna employ anybody who's a member of the Communist Party or any other group that's subversive of the country, we're not going to hire them and we're not going to employ them. And everybody's going to have to, didn't say everybody's going to have to do a loyalty oath immediately, but that was the basic principle. So nothing much happened for a couple of years. It took a while for the Hollywood 10 to be convicted and all this. Um, but gradually the American Legion formed its own Americanism Committee. Um, which started, and, and you know, other groups did this, the Motion Picture Alliance, this group of, of screenwriters, Gary Cooper was on the board of that, John Wayne, others, Hedda Hopper, Martin Berkeley became an important guy in that group, and they would basically take the reports of the committee and go, in the com and the annual reports where the committee would list the cooperative witnesses, the uncooperative witnesses, the people who'd been named in sessions. And they would then take that and, uh, and then present it in other forms and send reports to the studios. And each major studio that had signed the Waldorf thing had a, a, someone who was in charge of vetting employees. And you know, some of these people were on payroll, others would be hired to do a movie. If, you wanted, if they wanted to hire you to direct the movie, first they'd check you out and see if you were on a list. And even if you weren't on a list, unless you were sort of already cle pre-cleared, you'd have to sign some sort of statement saying you'd never been one. But if you were on a list, you had to go a lot further than that. 
So when you ask them, everybody said, well, no, we didn't have a blacklist. I mean, we just, but we're not going to hire people who work for subversive organizations. But there's no blacklist. It wasn't a formal thing in, the, in Hollywood, but there were lists, published lists. And if the American Legion caught you hiring someone, they threatened to picket your movie. So there was a very strong blacklist. And it really, and the question of how long it lasted is fascinating too. Um, at least a decade. Um, in Hollywood, um, and I got into this when I was out there, um, Stanley Kramer, who is, was a great liberal, he's the director eventually of Inherit the Wind and Judgment at Nuremberg, and guess who's coming to dinner? Yeah, he's, he's well, um, well, Stanley and Carl had been, you know, they'd, they'd been partners, and, but it was Stanley who fired Carl. There's a great irony here that the, it's the liberal fire, firing the slightly more radical guy, blacklisting him. And, you know, Stanley's an easy villain in that in some ways, but in fact, he couldn't have stood up to the pressure of, of this, or he would have been called out. Um, and Stanley helped break the blacklist in the late 1950s. He hired two guys to write the script for The Defiant Ones, this Tony Curtis, Sidney Poitier movie. They used pseudonyms, but at the same time, he actually had them in the movie. The two guys had a brief scene in the movie, <laughs> and he hired them again for Inherit the Wind. He paid them well. Meanwhile, Kirk Douglas hired Dalton Trumbo to write the script for Spartacus, and Otto Preminger hired, you know, hired Trumbo to do Exodus. And they uh, both gave Trumbo his real, real byline. So it kind of these, these three, I think, get, should get a lot of credit and do. Incidentally, there's a, there's a Trumbo movie coming out later this year with Brian Cranston playing Trumbo. Um, it's been filmed, so I assume it's coming out. It may never come out, but I suspect it will. But it'll go into some of this, I suspect. So it's really, it takes to 1960, and for some people it takes even longer. Um, you know, it, it's just astonishing how long that it lasted for a lot of people. I remember being struck by, I remember being struck by when Elia Kazan got, like, oh, either yes. got an Academy Award or an AFI Award or something like yes. that, maybe in the 80s or 90s, 90s. and there was still 90s. so much emotion caught up in the fact that he had named, named names. And, and that was... The first time I really realized how powerful that culture of the blacklist had been. There are children on the blacklist, you know, red diaper babies, pink diaper babies, whatever, who have had to live with this. This was this really split up families. Lee Grant, the TV, the actress, writes in her memoir. She was blacklisted for 15 years, and then her own her ex husband accused her of having named him to get off the blacklist. You know that kind of thing. So the real emotional. Anger is within a community, you know. I used to cover Israel. Yes, Jews and Arabs are fighting a hundred-year war and all that, but the real angry betrayal stuff occurs among Jews with each other, or in Gaza where people are being killed by Hamas, Palestinians. You know, if you betray your tribe, that's when things get really nasty and really emotional. And that's why the story of black, one of the reasons why the emotional uh, pull of this doesn't go away. Is it fair to say that it's harder to successfully destroy records now than it was back then? It seems to me as a continuing theme of what you talked about today was that there are missing records all over the place. And do you see that as systematic destruction of records or is it just happenstantial? Both, I'm sure. And I, I wouldn't, I would never underestimate the, the capacity of, of um, of public officials or private people to destroy records. The stuff that's gotten here is protected, but I, you know, a lot of stuff probably never sees the light of day over here. Yeah, oh yeah, beautifully protected. The pro yeah. No, I mean, you know, that's your job. And, uh, and you know, I have to say, the archivists and people who work at this are just wonderful. Um, not just here, but at all the places I've been hanging out lately. I just, um, you know, because you're dedicated to keeping this stuff alive and around and accessible, you know, it's having access to it that makes all the difference. It's not just enough that they exist somewhere. We have to be able to see it, you know. Um, 
because that's the only, it's a long distance form of accountability, but it is a form of accountability and it, I think it makes people think twice about some of the stuff they pull. I'm sure there are a lot of lawyers at the White House who are still regretting, not at this White House, but at, from the Bush White House and the Bush Justice Department are still regretting that they didn't deep six those torture memos. And the CIA, and I, I sympathize, I don't sympathize, but I understand why Rodriguez at the CIA decided the best thing to do with those tapes, video cassettes of uh, waterboarding, was to burn them. Well, uh, we have uh, wound our way to the end of the hour and then some. I have a feeling we could stay here a great deal longer. I'm sure Glenn will be happy to take your questions. And uh, we obviously support your work, are enthusiastic about it, and commend you for delving back into this issue after it's sat there for about 35 years after the, the work of Navasky and others. And so I, I, uh, so we're looking forward to having you back. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Be happy to come. Back. <laughs>